On today's Plate of History Beans, I want to talk about Fanny Porter and Mary Porter, a pair of famous prostitutes from the Old West era. In the latter part of the 19th century, there weren't a great number of opportunities for a woman on her own. She might work as a teacher, laundress, seamstress, or if she lived in a city, in a factory or retail establishment. The most lucrative job, however, in many cases, was as the proprietor of a boarding house or such businesses exist nowadays are more commonly known a bordello. In the sometimes fictional and sometimes factual world of Old West lore, the kind-hearted and practical prostitute stands alongside cowboys, Indians, sheriffs, gunslingers, and outlaws as a familiar trope. If you're my age, you may recall the character of Miss Kitty from the television show Gunsmoke. I find it a bit humorous now to think of how I and my staunch church-going parents didn't think twice about Miss Kitty's character. It simply didn't occur to us to look closely at the morality hidden behind her kind and practical persona. We didn't think of her as providing a service. She was more of a kind sounding board for Sheriff Matt Dillon. The odd thing about Miss Kitty is that upon further examination, it seems that the show's portrayal of a woman in a profession we view nowadays as distasteful or exploitative may not have been entirely false. For a time, there were frontier towns populated mostly by men, and I think perhaps prostitutes did serve on some occasions as leaders in their communities. With that said, however, prostitution, no matter the era, is a degrading and dangerous avocation. Miss Kitty from Gunsmoke gave us a highly fictionalized version of what these women's lives were like. I think our more modern view that prostitution is a form of human trafficking was as true then as it is now. These were real women who suffered just as anyone would in similar circumstances, Miss Kitty from Gunsmoke notwithstanding. In my novel Hunting Charm, I follow the journey of Doreen Tarwater. Her character is roughly based upon a pair of Texas prostitutes who made names for themselves in the latter part of the 19th century. Fanny Porter started a boarding house, as brothels were commonly called at the time, in San Antonio and Mary Porter, no relation to Fanny, started her sporting establishment in Fort Worth. The specifics about both women are slim, so I'll start with a bit of general information. Fanny and Mary Porter ran what were called boarding houses. This was the term most commonly used to designate a bordello at the time. A boarding house at the time might also be a place, similar to a hotel, where one could rent a room but for the purposes of today's plate of history beans, I will use the term to de designate a bordello. It's hard to believe nowadays, but during the latter part of the 19th century, towns like San Antonio and Fort Worth often had many boarding houses and other establishments, saloons, and gambling halls where a man might solicit the company of a woman for an hour or the entire night to give you an idea of how different things were, around the turn of the 20th century, the city of San Antonio actually published a booklet listing over 100 brothels, saloons, dance halls, and boarding houses where a lonely cowboy might spend his hard-earned cash on a weekend. In the sense of how people regarded prostitution, things were very different. What we now deem criminal activity was not only common practice, but in some cases supported by city officials. Fanny Porter was born in England but traveled to the U.S. as an infant. She is said to have lived in New Orleans, but by the age of 15, she was in San Antonio working as a prostitute. By the age of 20, she had a house of her own at the corners of Durango and San Saba Streets in downtown San Antonio. 
Fanny is famous not because her situation was unusual. As I've already mentioned, there were dozens of boarding houses in San Antonio at the time, but her place was one of the best, and she paid host to famous clients. Perhaps the most notable were the outlaws Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It is believed those notorious train robbers met at a place at Fanny Porter's establishment. Ms. Place deserves a plate of history beans of her own and has been fictionalized in several movies, including the blockbuster film from 1969 starring Robert Redford and Paul Newman. In that movie, Miss Place, played by Catherine Ross, is said to be a school teacher. Miss Place, as far as I can tell, never taught school, but she did begin a romantic liaison with both Harry Longabaugh, the Sundance Kid's real name, and possibly for a brief time, Robert Leroy Parker, Butch Cassidy. Those relationships and the exploits of the Wild Bunch Butch and Sundance's gang made for a great movie. If you haven't seen it, move Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid right to the top of your list. Fanny Porter's brothel housed other famous politicians, gunslingers, and enjoyed for a time the protection of San Antonio public officials. Her establishment reportedly had carpeted floors, glass fixtures, silk sheets, and on special occasions, served champagne to important clients. Details are mostly anecdotal. Author James D. Horan, the main source of information on Fanny, confused her with another famous madam from the time, a woman named Mary Porter, who had a similar establishment in Fort Worth during that Cowtown's, Cowtown's heyday. If San Antonio was a wild place to visit in the late 19th century, Fort Worth was even wilder. Like San Antonio, Fort Worth had a red light district that served as home to dozens of brothels, saloons, and gambling halls. That section of Fort Worth, a roughly five block square, was later called Hell's Half Acre. I have a plate of history beans in an earlier episode about Hell's Half Acre, if you're interested. I'll put a link below. In the 1890s, Mary Porter allegedly ran one of the finest brothels in Fort Worth. Like Fanny, she ran a clean operation. Her girls were subject to regular medical checkups and sheets changed between clients. Mary was supposedly arrested 130 times over a period of five years, but it's said she never spent a night in jail. Unlike Fanny, Mary left a sizable estate at the time of her death, but because of her profession, she was relegated to an unmarked grave for nearly a century. As a testament to her notable life, however, 100 years later in 2009, a group of history buffs in Fort Worth located her grave and paid to have a headstone placed there. Both Fanny and Mary Porter, as vague as their stories are today, provided me with enough confidence to believe my character, Doreen Tarwater, and her entrepreneurial spirit aren't completely unrealistic. That's it for today's Plate of History Beans. As always, if you like my content, I would be grateful if you would hit those like and subscribe buttons. If you're interested in learning more about Fanny and Mary Porter, I'll place a couple of links below. Likewise, if you're following my novel, Hunting Charm, I have a link to my author's page on Amazon. Now it's time for chapter 27 of my novel, Hunting Charm. Hope to see you again next week on the Contemporary Old West with B.F. Biles. Chapter 27, The Black Knight. That oath might have killed me. It's clear you couldn't protect me if there were five more like you. Did you even try to stop that jackass? Did you even draw your pistol? Doreen's tirade left Patty Patterson so flustered he barely managed to reply. Well, I, Leroy, 
Don't mean no harm. He's just hard to handle when he's drinking. Nicest feller you could meet when he's sober. A little hard to handle. He raped me and destroyed my only good undershirt. You and the rest of your idiot cowboys can forget about any more rolls today and possibly even the rest of the week. She waved Patterson away, but the baffled Irishman remained standing uneasily by the tent flap. The thing is, we ain't seen Leroy, and he's one of my best hands. You ain't seen him, have you? Of course I saw him. Are you an idiot? Didn't you hear me say he raped me last night? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, no, I, I ain't an idiot. What I mean is, d did you see which direction Leroy went after the, uh, well, uh, after his visit? She stormed through the tent flap and slapped Patty hard, a stinging blow that sent the Scotsman reeling backwards. Do you think I followed him? I hope the asshole fell off the embankment and into the river. I hope he's dead. <laughs> that ain't kind. Patterson rubbed his jaw. Like I say, Leroy ain't perfect, but wishing the man dead, he raped me. Well, now, that's... Listen, you said he lived here after he... Well, after he got him some... He didn't get some, you moron. He raped me. I told him to leave it and come back tonight, and he forced his way in here, and he raped me. Do you understand the meaning of the word? Do you even understand the difference? He took me by force. If we were in Kansas City, he would be hanged. Do you understand, you idiot? I know what rape is, but a bit of horror is different. Well... Uh, most folks agree that a whore ain't the same as a proper lady. Are you saying I don't have the right to say no to someone? You're a complete idiot. Don't, don't be calling me an idiot no more. Patterson's temper flared, but Doreen slapped him a second time. If you act like an idiot, I plan to call you an idiot. Now I ask you a question. Are you saying that I can't say no or have some time to myself? <laughs> Patterson paused, rubbing his cheek again. Like I said, a normal gal has every right to say no to a feller. In fact, a feller that would force a respectable gal who wasn't an old whore to... To uh, do him wouldn't be much of a man. A feller like that ought to be hanged. So you're saying I'm not respectable? I ain't saying you ain't respectable. Uh, just you're clearly saying that if any of the grungy cowboys from your camp come over here, I don't get to say no, even in the middle of the night. Do you recall me telling you last night I was done for the evening? Well, yeah, I recall, but here's the deal. No, there's no deal. Your job was to take care of me, and you failed to do so. You allowed another cowboy to come in here after I was asleep and rape me. Now, I'm beginning to doubt you're capable of fulfilling our contract. I ain't incapable, except maybe in the case of Leroy. I mean, he can't reason with Leroy when he's drunk. He gets a thought in his head. I don't give a damn what he gets in his head. But see, here's the thing. If a girl decides to whore, she has to be willing. So a proper woman can be raped, but a businesswoman can't. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't think most folks regard a whore as a business person. <laughs> I ain't no legal expert, but I do seem to recall a similar case where the judge decided because the girl was a whore, the feller who had relations with her forcibly wasn't really raping, so to speak. You're an idiot. Doreen, disgusted with the conversation, entered her tent, pulling the flap closed behind her. 
Don't expect to get any today and tell your friends they won't be getting any either. A long pause ensued. For a moment, Patty considered accepting Doreen's edict. Angry from all the slaps and name-calling, however, he recalled how, on one occasion in Dallas, he had witnessed an argument between a bar girl and the owner. The barkeep, who wore a wide belt, had pulled the leather strap from his waist and threatened his employee. Patterson couldn't recall if the owner struck the barmaid, but he did remember the woman cowering and begging for mercy. Perhaps, Patty thought, such forceful action was needed in Doreen's case. In those few seconds, Patty even reasoned that the situation with Doreen was an opportunity for personal growth. By confronting a petulant employee, he would be sharpening his management skills. Patty Patterson steeled himself, then removed his belt. He recalled how the barkeep had presented a terrifying aspect, one both merciless and unyielding. Then, with a deep breath, he entered her tent. What are you doing in here? Doreen spat. Get out and don't come back today. I ain't taking this bullshit from no horror, Patterson said, his voice menacing. Are you threatening me? Doreen asked. Despite the realization that Patty Patterson was a weak man, a chill, a fear snaked up her spine. I'm here to tell you how things is gonna be. Patty raised his arm and struck Doreen solidly across her right shoulder with the belt. Patterson, accustomed to a crew of Chinamen and former slaves, knew that one blow might not be adequate, so he prepared to swing a second time. Just as quickly, though, Doreen responded with an angry scream and charged, kicking and clawing at Patty's face. Unfortunately for Doreen, Patterson responded forcefully, striking her with his fist, a blow which ended any thought Doreen had regarding retaliation. She fell again, this time cowering on the ground next to the cot. I ain't having no her arguing about what she is or ain't doing. You understand me, Missy? You'll regret this, Doreen sobbed. My father owns a stockyard in Abilene, and I promise you he will do whatever I ask of him, including seeing you hung for striking his daughter. Then Doreen thought of Cactus Branch, of how he had calmly murdered Leroy the night before. Perhaps Henry Walker lurked somewhere nearby, and Patty Patterson would soon be begging for mercy. Yeah, and I got an uncle in New Orleans who's a pirate. He's got a chest of gold and a hook on one hand. Patterson started to raise the belt again, but a degree of doubt had already taken hold. Disciplining his workers was one thing, but Something about the situation troubled him. I won't have to wait for my father. Doreen's voice became a chilling whisper. If a single man arrives at my tent tonight, you'll be dead by tomorrow morning, just like your fat friend. Oh, yeah? And just who's gonna kill me? Are you saying you killed Leroy? Do you think a wealthy man like my father would allow me to travel alone? Doreen spoke the words slowly, relishing their effect on Patterson. What is that supposed to mean? It means I'm not alone, you idiot. I thought I might enjoy having a bit of extra money, but I can see you're an uncivilized pig. If I see you again, you're a dead man. If you ain't alone, then where is this other member of your traveling party? I don't see jack shit other than you. Patterson lowered his arm, the belt hanging loosely at his side. Don't worry about it. My friend re prefers to remain anonymous. Doreen paused for effect. You'd better hide in your tent tonight, because my guardian angel will be coming for you. There are things in this world you can't imagine. I ain't hiding in no tent, Patty stuttered. I think you're about to, uh, for a shit. 
I suggest you clear out of here now. You aren't going to find your friend Leroy. Remember what I said. This time, Patterson, confused by Doreen's story and the fact that Leroy hadn't returned to camp, stepped backwards. I plan on coming back. I, I plan on getting me some more of that pussy. Don't bet on it, asshole. Uh, uh, no count horror like yourself. Ain't no lawman gonna say you were right. And if you hurt Leroy or uh, killed him, well, there's laws. Laws to say to that, Missy. Who's to say? I'm not a respectable lady traveling with her bodyguard. You will meet him tonight, by the way. If we go into court, though, you can be assured my father will be there with a high-priced lawyer, and you will hang for forcing a respectable woman into a life of whoring. I didn't force you to, I suppose. The judge would enjoy hearing about how you didn't force me when you slapped me repeatedly with your belt. Hmm? Little Patty, better just run along now. The Black Knight is nearby. Black Knight? What in hell? The name had come out without thinking, but in her mind, Cactus Branch had become more than a specter to haunt her dreams. She understood instinctively the disfigured former slave had attached himself to her in some unexplained way. She had already been calculating the possibility of taking advantage of Henry's odd allegiance. I would run away if I were you, Doreen said. I... Patterson paused, looking about nervously. I ain't afraid of a black <laughs> knight. <laughs> Fact is, there ain't no such thing. If you had a protector, why ain't he here right, right here with you? Leroy probably stepped off the embankment, like you said before, and broke his neck or something. I was planning on leaving anyhow. You best expect to see some of the men later. Patterson brandished the belt once more, then began threading the leather strap back through his pants. Fine. Send your cowboys. More men for my father to hang. Doreen sensed the victory. If you ain't planning on whoring no more, then I reckon I'll be taking this tent and cock back. And why is that? Do I need to remind you of what I said about my father? I think you're bluffing. Patterson placed a hand on his belt, thinking he might remove the leather strap a second time for effect. His will failed, however. Years of mediocrity, times when he had assumed too much and been wrong, defeated him. His brother, a bank man manager, peripherally responsible for the financing and building of the Kansas and Texas line, had used his influence to get Patty the job as crew foreman. Patty had sworn he would be less of a no-count drunk. Albert, a church-going man, would be appalled at the revelation that Patty was running a prostitution ring as a side venture to his normal duties. If word of the situation should surface, Patty would not only lose his job, but all standing with his family. He tapped his belt buckle, sneered at Doreen, and slunk from her campsite. After Patterson disappeared into the brush, Doreen felt considerably better. Without a doubt, Patty would circulate the story of her mysterious black knight. Of course, having mentioned Henry Walker, she would now have to speak with the former slave and follow through on her plan to offer him a job providing security. Fortunately, the idea of speaking with Henry no longer seemed as intimidating. An hour later, when a skinny cowboy arrived with four dollars in his hand, asking if he might get a little, she felt so gracious with her new plans regarding Henry, she said, Tell the boys they can come on back this evening, except Patty. You tell him if I see him again, he's in big trouble. Should I tell them I need to just come on out? 
Patterson said you weren't whoring for him no more. The cowboy seemed shy and harmless. One of the others from your camp, Leroy, I believe, entered my tent last night and brutalized me. So I'm not feeling well. Dorian looked carefully at the cowboy's face for signs of sympathy. Yes, ma'am, Patterson told us about Leroy. I ain't surprised. He ain't much count as far as most of us is concerned. We figure if he's off dead someplace, it's just as well on account of him being such a, pardon the language, an a-hole. Doreen collected herself, considering again the gold she had made the previous day. Easy money, she realized, and plenty more to be had if she could just master the sudden nervousness she felt. Like I said, Doreen repeated, her tone firm and confident, despite her fluttering heart. I ain't feeling up to a roll just now, but please check back this evening after 6 p.m. I know four dollars is a lot, but considering the merchandise, you must admit it's not a bad bargain. Yes, ma'am. We was all saying the same thing, how you... Well, you're a daisy, ma'am. A lily of the west, just like the song. Doreen looked at the skinny cowboy. He smiled at her reassuringly, still holding the four dollars. He was kind of cute. Still, the idea of taking him into the tent didn't seem possible at the moment. Tell the boys it's the same deal as yesterday. One at a time. You may come first, around six this evening. As the skinny cowboy left, she turned and sat on a log gazing across the Red River. She wondered if Cactus Branch might be there somewhere, observing her campsite. A clear plan had taken shape in her mind. Cactus Branch had formed a mental bond to her that she couldn't explain. Perhaps it all stemmed from the night on the prairie when she had failed to see his deformity and had taken him into her hand. Still, he had called her his angel twice now, and he had spoken the word as if it had some meaning beyond a mere flirtation. Why had he called her his angel? Resolved to get an answer and to secure Henry's services, she decided she must make her move. She had seen Henry cross the bridge early that morning. Hopefully, finding his camp across the river wouldn't be difficult. Cotton socks remained a few feet away, tied on a long tether. Doreen gathered her bridle and approached the gentle animal. Cotton socks accepted the bit easily, and a few minutes later she had crossed the bridge and made the turn on to the game trail leading to Henry Walker's campsite.